The View from the Rickshaw, or Winning the Battle for Democracy. The first step in the revolution by the working class is to raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class to win the battle of democracy. That's what was written in 1848. But what does this actually mean? Did it just mean the overthrow of kings, as happened in France in 48? Does it mean the establishment of republics? Does it mean universal suffrage? Or does it mean something much more radical? Now, obviously, in Britain, we're still a monarchy. We still have a king and a house of lords. And this means that the establishment of a republic seems to many people to be a radical step. But that's an illusion. Look at France. Is France really a democracy? It's certainly a republic, but is it a democracy? Does it, why does it enforce policies that a large part of the population oppose? Why did you have the Yellow Vest uprising a few years ago um, right across the country? They were demanding radical democracy instead. Now let's look at the words. Raise the proletariat to the position of ruling class. That's equivalent to winning the battle for democracy. So what it's saying is proletariat as rulers equals democracy. Now, that's a very old definition. It goes right back to Aristotle. Aristotle said the real difference between democracy and oligarchy is poverty and wealth. Where men rule by reason of their wealth, whether they are few or many, that is an oligarchy. And where the poor rule, that is a democracy. So the poor as rulers is equal to democracy. Now that's not something that is the current understanding of the term. But that was the classical understanding of the term. And almost certainly the understanding that the writers of the Communist Manifesto had. Now let's look at what's happened in Britain. There's just been an election a month or so ago to which the Labour Party won the election and Starmer became Prime Minister. They won a huge majority, 63% of all MPs. But this majority was based on a small minority of the electorate voting for them. Probably only around 20% of the population voted for them. Twice as many people didn't vote as voted Labour. And then the riots, which the right started up in August, showed the risk the Labour Party faced from their weak popular vote share. The voter turnout was very low at the last election, partly because there the was substantial abstention by um, potential Labour voters because of the shift to the right by the Labour Party. Voter turnout was only 60%. The Labour Party got 63% of common seats on the basis of 34% vote share, which when you multiply it through comes down to 20% of the electorate. So a huge majority in Parliament on the basis of a small minority of the population voting for them. The Conservatives got 19% of the seats on the basis of 14% of the electorate. So clearly most of the electorate didn't support either Labour or Conservatives, but they got the overwhelming majority of the seats. So what's the answer? Well, a simple answer is to say proportional representation, which is what the smaller parties demand. And this addresses the glaring unfor um, unfairness of the current voting system. But it diverts attention from two central issues. The first is that we're not actually governed by Parliament. 
were ruled by His Majesty's government, which is a much smaller group, about 25 people, who swear loyalty to the Crown and make um, all important decisions. And they are His Majesty's ministers. So you have to look up at the social makeup and economic position of this much smaller core group who really hold power. If you look at the Conservative cabinet that was just replaced, its net wealth was around a billion pounds of those men and women sitting round the table. The Prime Minister himself, then Prime Minister himself, had a fortune of more than half a billion. Jacob Rees-Mogg, 150 million. Nadim Zahawi, 100 million. It goes on. But clearly this was a cabinet of the very rich. It met every criterion of Aristotle's definition as an aristocracy, uh, as an oligarchy. It is, was, was and didn't pretend to be anything other than ruled by the rich. The newer cabinet is quite different. It's much more working class. Only 4% of the Labour cabinet went to private schools, which means the majority had working class parents. But are they yet representative of the general population? I don't think so. The first point is that 96% of the cabinet went to university. All of them were university educated, other than Angela Rayner here. Now, is this good? Well, you might say it's good to be re ruled by well-educated people. And the, but this idea that the country should be read, run by an educated elite is actually a meritocratic or aristocratic idea rather than a democratic one. And it's not necessarily in the interest of the general electorate. 31% of the electorate went to university. 69% therefore didn't go to the university or a university. This means that 69% of the population, 69% of voters, only have Angela Rayner to represent in them in government. The 31% who did go to university have all the rest of the cabinet. So effectively this means that whilst the Tory cabinet was a cabinet of rich oligarchs, the Starmer cabinet is a government of the professional middle class. And the non-professional classes only have that one representative. Now, previous Labour governments actually had more genuine working class representation in them. Um, the Attlee cabinet had three manual working class members with no university education. Morrison, Bevan and Bevin and Bevan. And let's look not at education but at income. Not only do graduates earn more than most of the population. So gr graduates are in a relatively privileged position, but MPs earn far more than most graduates. So the median salary for a non-graduate in Britain was 26,000. Graduates earn about 36,000. People with a PhD or postgraduate education earn 42,000. An MP earns 84,000. So not only were all these people graduates, so the background they came from was somewhat above that of the general population, but they had been MPs for many years, earning almost three time, three or four times the median salary. Well, a rickshaw ride is much more fun when someone else faces the hardship of doing the hard work. What did Rachel Reeves decide? 
first thing she did was to cut fuel payment to pensioners. Uh, the justification for this was that some pensioners were well off and didn't need winter fuel payments. But the threshold was anyone above any pensioner who earned more than 11,000, i.e. Was, their pension was so low that they were entitled to pension credits, would have their winter fuel cut off. Now, Rachel Reeves, who decided this, is on an income of 154000 a year. And she was cutting payments to people on 11000 So, I think she was somewhat insulated from the situation. If she serves five years as Chancellor, she will be entitled to a ministerial pension of some 52,000. So she would never be in a position where winter fuel was an issue. So we've identified several problems here. The voting system is unrepresentative. The class structure of the actual government, whether it's Labour or Tory, is unrepresentative of the general population. And those who rule over us are in a privileged economic position just due to their ruling, quite independent of their personal wealth when they went into it. So you have to ask what kind of constitutional change would give us a real democracy, uh, an actual government of the people, by the people. So here are some answers. The first thing would be to address the economic inequality. To say that representatives should get no more than average income, which would be about 33,000 in the UK. And this was the policy that was actually adopted in France in 1870-71, during the period of the, the Commune. Um, and it was something that Marx advocated in his history of the, the French Civil War. The problem with this is it's a good idea in itself, but how do you stop the representatives simply voting themselves higher salaries? You may start off with them getting 33,000 a year. But if they have the power to make laws, they're likely to decide they want more. One possibility would be to make the salaries of MPs and ministers only raisable after a referendum. Now, that raises the general issue of referendums. Uh, the... Referendums can come about when the state decides it, which was what happened with the EU referendum. But in some countries and under some circumstances, you have what's known as the right of initiative. If a petition passes a certain threshold, there has to be a referendum on it. Beyond that, you can have the right of veto, again subject to a threshold, a referendum can veto any parliamentary law. And finally, you could have control of taxes and expenditure to be approved or rejected by the electorate. To actually bring these decisions into popular control. And these are essentially the demands of the French yellow vests, the first two. They didn't go as far as demanding control of taxes and expenditure. Now, the next thing, which is obvious in the British constitutional situation, is to talk about the House of Lords. But if you just replace the House of Lords with a second elected House, no change has actually occurred. It's obvious there's no democratic justification for having hereditary peers, bishops, the Prime Minister's illegitimate kids and other political appointees making the laws as they have as they do in Britain. So it could be replaced by a house drawn at lot each year from the electorate. Just ordinary voters 
selected like a jury to form the House of Plebs instead of a House of Lords. That would be genuinely representative in terms of class, age, race and sex. And you would have to also say that the restricted powers of the House of Lords, which were brought in in 1911 by the Parliament Act, would have to be removed. The two houses would have to be equal, so that the Commons would no longer be able to overrule an upper house made up of members of the public. Now, it may be said these are all half measures. You should do away with both the House of Commons and the House of Lords and replace both with the House of Plebs. There's a risk in doing that, in that um, if you go that far, you're never going to get any electoral party to support these reforms. You, commit, you would be committing yourself to a strategy of abstentionism of the type that the Irish Republicans followed. Because once any MP gets his, seat under the, his feet under the table, they're going to be keen on keeping the House of, Law, House of Commons. They're going to be convinced, having been elected themselves, of the virtues of election rather than random selection. So maybe we should aim for some kind of compromise, like proportional representation for Parliament, an oath of loyalty to the people, not the king, annual elections, as the Chartists demanded, and the ministers elected by both houses, with half coming from the House of Plebs. But this is a matter of compromise, how to come up with a feasible political strategy to actually bring about democracy in Britain. And who's going to be interested in this? Well, obviously, small parties like the Workers' Party should be interested in this. So should the independents on the left. Probably one might be able to persuade the Green Party of this. But you need some kind of broad grouping of parties that agree that you need a radical change, that the existing constitutional system needs to be overthrown, that it's basically illegitimate. Now, the paradox is this is also something that right-wing parties would agree with because they are small parties and don't do well out of the current system. So you might get a wider um, constituency of support for this than just the people who would vote for George Galloway. I leave that uh, open at the moment because it's unclear what the best strategy would be.